At Maverick Public Relations, growing your influence is their specialty. NPR works with remarkable companies in the cannabis industry to deliver exceptional results. Experience big agency expertise and outstanding client service delivered by seasoned and knowledgeable experts. Connect with Maverick PR today and move your company to the next level. Visit them today at www.themaverickpr.com. From a studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. Now, here's your host and bud tender, Gary Johnston. Well, thank you, son, for that wonderful introduction, and thanks to you for coming on back to the Cannabis Podcast. Here we are at episode 89. If this is your very first visit to the Cannabis Podcast, well, welcome along for the ride. I hope you're going to enjoy it, especially if you are interested in cannabis, because that's what we're going to be spending the next 30 or 40 minutes talking about. Now, remember, this program is intended only for those 19 or older in your jurisdiction and is intended purely for entertainment purposes. You should always consume your cannabis responsibly. And what have we got coming up this episode? Well, we got a whole bunch of stuff, as usual. Thinking about growing some weed this year? I've got a site you should check out. It's called 10buds.com. Plus, they had a feature where they talked about the Cannabis Podcast. We'll talk about that. We're also going to take a couple of stories from OkanaganZ.com this episode. A story that many have thought was, or at least suspected for a long time. And I, in fact, have talked about this at a couple of talks I have done. That runner's high you talked about? may actually come from cannabinoids. A story from MJ Biz Daily on the fact that Canadian cannabis producers have sold less than 20% of their output since legalization happened. That's a bit of a shock. Back to OkanaganZ.com for a story on the BC Chamber of Commerce who are a little upset that the legal cannabis industry they feel is underperforming. We'll talk about that. On Cultivar Corner, we are going to test out the Yocan Armor a new piece of hardware for doing concentrates, and the concentrates we're going to put inside of that, some rad mixtape special live resin. And in fact, this is going to be the first cultivar corner that's going to have video attached to it. Now, you have to be a member of the Cannabis Podcast in order to see that video, but that's a new step we're taking, and this is going to be the first episode for that. Plus, there could be a whole bunch of other things we'll figure out. we got some shout-outs for people. It's going to be fun. Thanks for coming along for Ride. This is episode 89 of the Cannabis Podcast. And before we get started, let's do some shout-outs. So first of all, a shout-out to Jordana. Now, Jordana has been coming into our store for a long, long time. She reps a particular product, and I, I try to stay away from actual brand and stuff. But Jordana, as I say, has been coming into the store for a while. Uh, and apparently, she's also been a listener of the podcast for a while. And it was only yesterday that she connected the Cannabis Podcast and myself as the host of said podcast. <laughs> so welcome along for the ride, Jordana. I'm glad you're here, and I'm also glad we get to see you a lot in the store. And let me also throw out a shout-out, speaking of the store, to Emma. Emma just became our assistant manager today. She has earned her position, and I'm really looking forward to what she's going to do to help us in the store. So there's a couple of shout-outs, and now here's a real shout-out to my friend J.S. from Quebec. You've heard me talk about him before. He has been a loyal listener of the podcast for probably since we began. Well, he also became the first monthly subscriber. You can do that at buymeacoffee.com slash cannabis podcast, where also, if you feel like it, you can buy me a doobie. But J.S. has become a member, and that means he gets access to some secret stuff like unreleased cultivar corners, his pick of some cannabis hats. And you know what? This is the real important thing, because this was his idea. Access to visuals from cultivar corner. So see the weed I'm smoking. See the effect it has. See how much fun I have smoking it. (laughs) You'll still get to hear it right here every episode in audio on the Cannabis Podcast, because this is where I live. But for members only, you'll get to see the magic behind cultivar corner. And more extras will come along as well as the members help to find what we're doing there. It's buymeacoffee.com slash cannabis podcast for all your details. And remember, if you like what you hear and you feel so inclined, feel free to buy me a doobie. From the Cannabis Infused Studio in the Clouds, this is the Cannabis Podcast. And let me take care of that cannabis infusion to make sure we are appropriately ready for this episode and Yes, we are. And the motivation for this episode, this portion, is from Simply Bear Organic, their BC Organic Blue Dream. 
I picked up seven grams of that today. That's not the feature on Cultivar Corner. That's just what I'm smoking to get ready for the story. <laughs> THC on this guy is at about 19.2%. Very nice taste. Enjoying it so far. And for our first story today, we are going to my friend David Wiley and OkanaganZ.com. This is a story, in fact, written by David Wiley. BC Chamber says, legal cannabis industry is underperforming. <gasps> That's shocking. <laughs> A bit of a sidebar before I even start on this. What I what I mean when I say that shocking, there has been such handcuffs placed on this industry to begin. The fact that it has succeeded to the level it has to this point is amazing. <laughs> that some stores are being successful, that, that more and more people are coming in and buying their weed in the legal market. But boy, they they designed this market to fail, it seems. <laughs> And I suspect that's going to be a portion of what's inside of this story. So there's the end of that sidebar. A new report from the BC Chamber of Commerce says the cannabis industry is not living up to its potential. The 33-page document put together by the Chamber's BC Cannabis Working Group. Another sidebar. I'm impressed they have a BC Cannabis Working Group in the Chamber. <laughs> end of sidebar. I'll try not to do, to, to do too many digressions as the story goes. This working group is putting forward a number of recommendations it says will put the province back in its rightful place at the head of the industry. Now, I like that. Although the cannabis industry has deep roots in British Columbia, the legal cannabis industry has performed below or at par with national and provincial averages in terms of total non-medical retail store sales and sales per capita, says the report's executive summary. These figures do not reflect the overall potential of the province's cannabis market. Among the 13 policy recommendations, allow private retailers to deliver directly using common carriers and app-based delivery services such as Skip the Dishes. Skip the Weed sounds kind of good, too. <laughs> Accelerate Farmgate to early this year and open it to all LPs and nursery license holders. Add an economic mandate for cannabis at the ministerial level. Remove the 20% vape tax. Now, that's a huge one. There are so many people who... <laughs> buy a vape and get so ticked off at the fact that there's a 20% additional tax on top of that. Rework the excise tax paid on cannabis. Now that's insane how much excise tax we pay for our cannabis. It's a dollar for every gram, I think, the last time it was calculated. Allow retailers to move inventory between its own stores. The Chamber says following its recommendations will unleash billions of dollars in private sector investments. That would mean more jobs, more tax revenue, and help re-establish BC as a leader in the industry. Titled Unlocking BC's Cannabis Industry, the report was created by a working group co-chaired by BC licensed producer Pure Sun Farms and cannabis retailer Kiero. Last year, the legal cannabis industry contributed more to cannabis economy than some of BC's most well-established sectors, such as forestry, mining, and meat manufacturing. And it continues to grow despite challenges faced across the board, says Pure Sun Farms president and CEO Mandesh Dosange. British Columbia can take a leadership position now to make tangible and responsible choices to propel this sector forward and make the most out of the opportunities cannabis has to offer to improve the province's competitiveness and diversify our economy. There's still lots of room to grow. In 2019, BC reported the lowest sales per capita in Canada at $18.87, less than one-fifth of the $101.30 per capita reported in PEI. Other Western Canadian provinces had significantly higher numbers. In Alberta, sales were $58.19 per capita. Saskatchewan, $62.53 over the same period. While Ontario was only slightly above BC at $19.50 per capita, and that was partially due to an initial slow rollout of retail licenses in Ontario, says the report. So far, legal sales in BC only capture a fraction of the available cannabis market, says the report. The illicit market still thrives. And the province still has some of the highest cannabis usage in the country, with almost 25% of adults reporting having used recreational cannabis in the past three months, it says. High reported usage, low sales per capita, and relatively flat prices suggest a thriving illicit market being inadvertently supported by barriers in the regulated industry. The report says regulatory obstacles are preventing the industry from living up to expectations. The working group says its recommendations are consistent with the provincial and federal government's objectives of eliminating the illicit market, keeping cannabis out of the hands of youth, and protecting public health and public safety. 
So, another excellent article, Mr. Wiley, that from the OZ, BC Chamber, not too happy with how the cannabis industry is underperforming, and I like some of their recommendations, but it would sure be nice to see the government make some changes, wouldn't it? <laughs> we have been waiting, well, over three years for that. And now another shout-out of sorts, I suppose. Let me say hi to Danny, Danny, the public relations officer from 10puds.com. Because as I mentioned at the front of the show, if you are thinking of doing some growing this year, you should be checking out 10buds.com, a great site with lots of information about growing cannabis. Now, when I say 10buds.com, let me be clear, it is the number 10 and then buds.com. Of course, you'll find the link to it back at cannabispodcast.com. So you can check it out from there, or you can just go directly there. If you're looking for some grow information this year or any time, 10buds.com, and again, let me be clear, it's the number 10buds.com. Plus, they also put together a list of top cannabis podcasts. And guess who you're going to find on that list? You'll find the link to that as well, back at cannabispodcast.com underneath this episode. So go check it out, and you can check out some other great cannabis podcasts as well. And thanks to 10buds.com. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. This is the Cannabis Podcast. Have you ever heard that there may have been an overabundance of cannabis in the country since legalization in 2018? Just pounds and pounds and bales and bales? <laughs> well, if you're of that opinion, this story may be of interest to you. This is from Matt Lamers, international editor at mjbizdaily.com. Cannabis producers in Canada have sold less than 20% of their production since the country launched adult use sales in October 2018. The newest data, which runs through 2020, implies that most of the cannabis produced from 2018 through last year was either stored in inventory or destroyed, and less than one-fifth ended up in retail stores. Now, that disconnect likely explains how the largest Canadian cannabis producers which account for most of the industry's production, together have lost more than $11 billion. Some industry experts blame poor quality cannabis for the sales shortfall. Good stuff sells, said Ian Dawkins, principal consultant of British Columbia-based Althing Consulting. Roughly 2.7 billion grams, or 2,976 tons of cannabis, were produced in Canada between October 2018 and December 2020. But MJ Biz Daily estimates that approximately 450 million grams reached store shelves. To arrive at that figure, they asked every provincial wholesaler how much cannabis they sold over a specific period of time. That data was combined with Health Canada's limited sales figures, which end in October of 2019. Data for Saskatchewan was provided by Seattle-based data analytics firm Headset. So why have sales been so low relative to production? Av Singh, cultivation expert at Nova Scotia-based Fleming and Singh Cannabis, believes Canada's largest licensed producers didn't have the know-how needed to produce cannabis at the scale they told their investors they could. Canadian LPs were quick in trying to capture as much of the market as possible, often building inferior facilities that were not designed to produce quality cannabis, Singh said. But Singh also said Canada's provincial and federal governments should shoulder some of the blame for throwing up roadblock after roadblock as the new industry was getting off its feet. Countries should legalize cannabis when governments have addressed their own stigma and preferably addressed the systemic racism associated with the criminalization of cannabis consumers, he said. I wish we could get that as a billboard and have it posted in every city and town across the country. What a great statement. Sorry for the sidebar. Of the 2.7 billion grams of cannabis produced between 2018 and 2020, 1.1 billion grams were stored in inventory, and at least 450 million grams were destroyed by producers for various reasons per Health Canada data. Another 6 million packages of dried cannabis, extracts, and edibles were destroyed. Experts believe that most of the unpackaged inventory currently sitting in warehouses across the country, which is almost 40% of overall production, is unsellable. I think it's a sign of fundamental dysfunction in the market, Althing Consulting's Dawkins said of the unsold inventory. There is increasing demand and increasing appetite for different products, and yet all of this product is overhanging. 
I don't think that product's ever going to move. It's orphaned forever. We have to get to a place where we recognize that this has become a mature commodity market. And if your product isn't moving, it's because no one wants it and never will, he said. Dawkins said the mountain of stored and destroyed cannabis is not reflective of the brands that are selling well. Indeed, the Canadian market in May rang up record sales of recreational cannabis. The companies that are succeeding at this don't destroy any excess inventory, he said. If you're producing enough cannabis to have any kind of leftover inventory, you have fundamentally misunderstood the market. All of the stuff being sold is coming from companies that are producing products that people want, to such an extent that they sell out of the distribution system as soon as they drop. The production capacity expansion needed to produce 2.7 billion grams of cannabis was rapid. By late 2017, investors had bankrolled more than enough cultivation area to meet recreational cannabis demand. But billions of dollars continued to flow into the largest greenhouses, fueled by stock market investors who valued cannabis companies solely on how much marijuana they could produce, using the funded capacity industry term, and executive bonuses partially tied to massive greenhouse build-outs. In October 2018, the monthly legal cannabis sales started Canadian producers controlled 452,000 square meters of growing area licensed for cannabis cultivation, according to Health Canada data. A year later, that figure had tripled to 1.3 million square meters. And by the end of 2020, that number was more than four times higher at 2.04 million square meters. That made cannabis the fourth largest greenhouse crop in Canada by area a level of production significantly out of step with demand. People entered the market too quickly, not fully understanding the importance of quality and how to cultivate quality, cultivation expert Singh said. The mentality of money over quality is flawed, but unfortunately for most of those who entered the cannabis space, it was not their own money. Singh said large producers underestimated a number of factors in that scale up, leading to a significant amount of cannabis being produced that was ultimately unsaleable including the importance of quality, as well as the infrastructure and knowledge required to grow quality flour, the increased challenges of pests and pathogens, as well as qualified and available labor. Mitchell Osak, president of Toronto-based Quanta Consulting, said the inventory situation is about to accelerate like a hockey stick because of all the outdoor production and new craft production entering the system. Canadian licensed producers added a record 220,000 kilograms of marijuana to their inventories in October of 2020. But OSAC also said some licensed producers are better at producing in-demand cannabis at appropriate prices than others. I think we're moving to a place in the industry where you have some LPs that are regularly turning their production inventories and adroitly managing demand-driven production. And some LPs that are going to have a massive inventory problem, he said. Inventory challenges are becoming more acute when companies launch new products and formats, i.e. inventory, into the market, not to mention increasing the overall complexity of the operations and financial management. After selling less than a fifth of the cannabis produced between 2018 and 2020, many of the biggest greenhouses that drove cannabis share prices higher amid the cannabis stock market mania of 2018 and 19 have been sold off for pennies on the dollar. One example is Canopy Growth's BC Tweed joint venture in British Columbia. Before Canopy spent nearly $500 million to acquire the remaining one-third interest of the joint venture it didn't already own, the company had poured $644 million into the two BC greenhouses and other facilities. The BC properties ended up selling for $40 million. And the two companies that shuttered the most facilities, Alberta headquartered Aurora Cannabis, and Ontario-based Canopy Growth have also reported the steepest losses. Canopy has lost $3.8 billion since its inception, and Aurora has run $4.1 billion deficit. Neither company has ever reported a profit. Thanks to Matt Lamers at MJ Biz Daily for that story. What a, what a good, insightful description and gives you a real understanding of what the problem in the industry is. And as was pointed out in that, in that story, here in BC, we have a whole lot of micro-producers 
that have joined together so that they have somebody who's distributing them and they are doing a marvelous business and I am pretty sure they are not destroying any of their inventory because it is selling before they have any need to destroy it. So clearly the big boys didn't learn their lesson. And I think we're going to see it is as an, and this was predicted, I think, a year ago here in the Cannabis Podcast. The future of cannabis is going to be local. And fortunately, this podcast is based in British Columbia, where I hope once more we are going to return to that esteemed status of the home of beautiful BC bud, all produced locally. <sighs> I can hardly wait. Are you ready for liftoff? Don't miss Canada's number one cannabis conference and trade show, Lift & Co Expo, coming this May 12-15 to 15 to Metro Toronto Convention Centre. Level up your industry intel at the Lift Cannabis Business Conference. Connect with movers and shakers from across the cannabis industry and preview new products and services from 250-plus exhibitors. Plus, everyone loves Lift & Co Expo's prizes, live music, and more. Visit liftexpo.ca for tickets. That's liftexpo.ca. THC, CBD, terpene profiles, what's in me? Oh, please explain to me. Go to the corner, go to the corner, oh yeah. Go to the corner, please explain this stuff to me. On Cultivar Corner today, we're taking a couple of different directions. First of all, we are trying out a new piece of hardware. It is the Yokan Armor which is great for doing some concentrates. Now, what concentrates what might we be putting in that? <laughs> Funny you should ask. How about some Rad Resin? Mixtape Special Live Resin. THC 70.5%. Sounds somewhat appropriate, doesn't it? <laughs> and so that's the first thing we're doing. The second is... We're trying something new with Cultivar Corner that was suggested by my friend J.S. from Quebec. Now, earlier in the episode, we talked about J.S. becoming a member and that getting him access to some special video versions of Cultivar Corner. And this is the first version of that, where you get to see my reaction. You get to see the weed. Well, in this case, you get to see the concentrate. And to see all the behind-the-scenes things that happen with Cultivar Corner that don't make it to air. Well, I guess it'll still make it to air, but you only get to see the videos when you remember at buymeacoffee.com slash cannabis podcast, just like JS did. So I said we're doing some live resin today. There is what we're doing. Give you a peek. Now, the reason I'm holding it back here is I was playing with this camera earlier today, trying to figure out whether the autofocus worked. I saw some of the reviews on the autofocus and it said, eh, it's a little wonky and it gets a little confusing. So I thought it would in fact be better if we left the autofocus off and I'll just keep the material back here a little bit so you can still see it, but perhaps just not as close as what the autofocus might. So this I said is Rad Live Resin, Mixtape Special, 70.5% THC. The Yocan is a real neat device. It comes with two concentrate containers, just like that. Each one of them has uh, two little uh, ceramic coils inside uh, to provide the heat and get that resin to hopping. And then you have the mouthpiece, which has a really big hole on it, so lots of nice airflow around it. And that's the last ingredient in our equation. So here we go. This is the Yokan Armor with Rad Mixtape Special Live resin. Whoa. Mm. As you saw, I got a fair amount of resin off that. <laughs> <laughs> And a pretty good hit. Mmm. Oh, that tastes good. Mmm. Really, really enjoy that. 
what are the components of what we're smoking? So the lineage is uh, Las Vegas lemon skunk and blueberry. I've never heard of Las Vegas lemon skunk before, but total terpenes, 3.8%, which accounts for the aromatic, oh, <coughs> the aromatic nature of the live resin in the container. Oh, wow. Just wonderful ascents. Terpenes are myrcene at 0.9%, limonene 0.9% as well, and pinene at 0.4%. Now, my reference, because the myrcene is at 0.9%, I suspect this is going to be a pretty heavy hitting indica. Whew. And it seems <laughs> to be pretty heavy hitting so far. Oh, forgot to turn the battery on. <laughs> That may indicate that it is doing pretty good. Now, obviously, I'm not going to be smoking a joint with this. And I won't be putting it in my Crafty Plus because it doesn't do well with these kind of concentrates. Mm. Now, I just put a pretty small dab into that pen. I, I did preload it because in my testing and getting ready to do this, I realized that <coughs> taking this little dab tool, picking up some of that resin, <coughs> and then depositing it <coughs> appropriately <coughs> in the concentrate holder, <coughs> I should probably stop talking until I finish coughing. There you go. So because it is concentrates, there are fairly heavy concentrations <coughs> of smoke and THC, which sometimes can create that coughing sensation. That's why I preloaded. <laughs> I may have got distracted there. Holy crap. <laughs> I'm, I'm really, really stoned right now. So I, of course, dive in for another. Mm. Oh, the taste of this is just absolutely delicious. Myrcene, limonene, and pinene. So definitely some pine notes and some of that citrus tone. I mean, the earthiness of myrcene I always find in almost every weed I smoke. Oh. Hmm. <coughs> so I think we have two success points here. Really impressed with the Yokan armor. Adjustable temperatures, and it does a really good job of heating up those concentrates. Holy mama mia. really blasted <laughs> which was my goal don't think that I'm disappointed because I'm not in fact in typical Gary fashion we'll go for one more So if you're looking for something for concentrates, this was like under 30 bucks. Concentrates weren't under 30 bucks. They were, I think, around 40. You too can have some success with the Yokan armor. Oh. And I have to say that 70.5% THC on the live resin. Has given me a pretty darn good high. All right, it is time for some education. Let's finish off this episode with another story from uh, my friends at OkanaganZ.com. Now, this is a special to Okanagan Z, and it was written by Hilary A. Marusak. It explains the runner's high. 
and how, in fact, it, it's kind of like cannabis. Many people have experienced reductions in stress, pain, and anxiety, and sometimes even euphoria after exercise. What's behind this so-called runner's high? New research on the neuroscience of exercise may surprise you. The runner's high has long been attributed to endorphins. These are chemicals produced naturally in the body of humans and other animals after exercise and in response to pain or stress. However, new research from the lab summarizes nearly two decades of work on this topic. They found that exercise reliably increases levels of the body's endocannabinoids, which are molecules that work to maintain balance in the brain and body, a process called homeostasis. Bit of a sidebar, you dive way back into the cannabis podcast, you'll hear about homeostasis. We did a, a whole episode on the endocannabinoid system. New research summarizes nearly two decades of work on the topic that found that exercise reliably increases levels of the body's endocannabinoids, which are molecules that work to maintain balance in the brain and body, a process called homeostasis. This natural chemical boost may better explain some of the beneficial effects of exercise on brain and body. She is a neuroscientist at the Wayne State University School of Medicine. Her lab studies brain development and mental health as well as the role of endocannabinoids in stress regulation, anxiety disorders in children and adolescents. The research has implications for everyone who exercises with the aim of reducing stress and should serve as a motivator for those who don't regularly exercise. Several decades of research has shown that exercise is beneficial for physical health. Studies find a consistent link between varying amounts of physical activity and reduced risk of premature death in dozens of chronic health conditions, including diabetes, hypertension, cancer, and heart disease. More recently, over about the past two decades, mounting research shows exercise is also highly beneficial for mental health. In fact, regular exercise is associated with lower symptoms of anxiety, depression, Parkinson's disease, and other common mental health or neurological problems. Consistent exercise is also linked to better cognitive performance, improved mood, lower stress, and higher self-esteem. It is not yet clear what is behind these mental health boosts. We do know that exercise has a variety of effects on the brain, including raising metabolism and blood flow, promoting the formation of new brain cells, a process called neurogenesis, and increasing the release of several chemicals in the brain. Some of these chemicals are called neurotrophic factors, such as brain-derived neurotrophic factor. BDNF is intricately involved in brain plasticity, or changes in activity of brain cells, including those related to learning and memory. Scientists have also shown that exercise increases blood levels of endorphins, one of the body's natural opioids. Opioids are chemicals that work in the brain and have a variety of effects, including helping to relieve pain. Some early research in the 1980s contributed to the long-standing popular belief that this endorphin release is related to the euphoric feeling known as the runner's high. However, scientists have long questioned that role of endorphins in the runner's high sensation, in part because endorphins cannot cross into the brain through the blood-brain barrier, which protects the brain from toxins and pathogens. So endorphins are not likely to be the main driver for the beneficial effects of exercise on mood and mental state. This is where our research and that of others points to the role of our body's natural versions of cannabinoids called endocannabinoids. You may be familiar with cannabinoids such as tetrahydrocannabinol, better known as THC, the psychoactive compound in cannabis, or you may have heard of cannabidiol, commonly known as CBD, an extract of cannabis that's infused in some foods, medicines, oils, and many other products. But many people do not realize that humans also create their own version of these chemicals called endocannabinoids. These are tiny molecules made of lipids or fats that circulate in the brain and body. Endo refers to those produced in the body rather than from a plant or in a lab. Endocannabinoids work on cannabinoid receptors through the brain and body. They cause a variety of effects, including pain relief, reduction of anxiety and stress, and enhanced learning and memory. They also affect hunger, inflammation, and immune functioning. Endocannabinoid levels can be influenced by food, time of day, exercise, obesity, injury, inflammation, and stress. It's worth noting that one should not be tempted to forego a run or bike ride and resort to smoking or ingesting cannabis instead. Endocannabinoids lack the unwanted effects that come with getting high, such as mental impairment. 
Studies in humans and in animal models are pointing to endocannabinoids, not endorphins, as the star players in the runner's high. These elegant studies demonstrate that when opioid receptors are blocked, one example by a drug called naloxone, people still experience euphoria and reduce pain and anxiety after exercise. On the flip side, the study showed that blocking the effects of cannabinoid receptors reduced the beneficial effects of exercise on euphoria, pain, and anxiety. While several studies have shown that exercise increases the levels of endocannabinoids circulated in the blood, some have reported inconsistent findings or that different endocannabinoids produce varying effects. We also don't know yet if all types of exercise, such as cycling, running, or resistance exercise like weightlifting, produce similar results. And it's an open question whether people with and without pre-existing health conditions like depression, PTSD, or fibromyalgia experience the same endocannabinoid boosts. To address the questions, an undergraduate student in her lab, Shreya Desai, led a systemic review and meta-analysis of 33 published studies on the impact of exercise on endocannabinoid levels. They compared the effects of an acute exercise session, like going for a 30-minute run or cycle, with the effects of chronic programs, such as a 10-week running or weightlifting program. They separated them out because different levels and patterns of exertion could have very distinct effects on endocannabinoid responses. They found that acute exercise consistently boosted endocannabinoid levels across studies. The effects were most consistent for a chemical messenger known as an antamide, the so-called bliss molecule, which was named in part for its positive effects on mood. Interestingly, it was observed that this exercise-related boost in endocannabinoids across different types of exercise, including running, swimming, and weightlifting, and across individuals with or without pre-existing health conditions. Although only a few studies looked at intensity and duration of exercise, it appears that moderate levels of exercise intensity, such as cycling or running, are more effective than lower-intensity exercise, like walking at slow speeds or low incline, when it comes to raising endocannabinoid levels. This suggests that it's important to keep your heart rate elevated, between about 70 and 80 percent of age-adjusted maximum heart rate, for at least 30 minutes to reap the full benefits. There's still a lot of questions about the links between endocannabinoids and beneficial effects from exercise. For example, they didn't see consistent effects for how a chronic exercise regimen, such as a six-week cycling program, might affect resting endocannabinoid levels. Likewise, it isn't yet clear what the minimum amount of exercise is to get a boost in endocannabinoids and how long these compounds remain elevated after acute exercise. Despite the open questions, the findings bring researchers one step closer to understanding how exercise benefits brain and body, and they offer an important motivator for making time for exercise during the rush of the holidays. And from the perspective of the Cannabis Podcast, they point to endocannabinoids... <laughs> being the cause of a runner's high rather than endorphins, which brings the circle full back to cannabis. So let me tell you about the author. Dr. Hilary A. Marusak is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Neurosciences at Wayne State University School of Medicine in Detroit, Michigan. And thanks to the OkanaganZ.com for publishing that. That was a deep dive into endocannabinoids and how they're much like THC and CBD. And before we go, a chuckle supplied by a customer. We have a certain percentage of the customers who come in who used to be growers, or at least they say they were, have been involved in the cannabis industry for years and years and years, at least they say they have. And <laughs> then they say things which just makes you question that. So this was one such bravado purporter who was in the store, and this was a story that I was told, and he you know, came in going on and on about you know, how he was such a good grower and you know, all better than the crap that's available in the legal market. And Although, of course, he ended up buying some weed before he left the store. It was as he left the store that he, that he let loose with, oh, and, and wedding cake, that's my favorite terpene. <laughs> and, of course, the bud tender just smiled and said, yeah, I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> and off they went. If there was ever anything you would like to comment on about the Cannabis Podcast, it's easy to do. Just send an email to info at CannabisPodcast.com. CannabisPodcast.com is also where you'll find all the links to the stories we talk about. And if you feel so inclined and you liked what you hear, you can go to buymeacoffee.com slash CannabisPodcast and buy me a doobie. That's it for episode 89 
of the Cannabis Podcast. From the Cannabis Infused Studio, high above the Okanagan Valley, this was the Cannabis Podcast. Podcast.